assalamu alaikum and good evening dear participants welcome you all in today's ecg lecture, lecture session today is our 82nd series uh, 82nd episode of lecture series organized by ecg study group ecg basic and beyond and topic of today is the supraventricular uh, is the white complex tachycardia and uh, supraventricular versus ventricular tachycardia this will be provided by none other than great electrophysiologist professor dr rafiq ahmed sir before start of the session i'd like to request professor abdulal jamil sir to speak about rafiq ahmed sir and then we proceed abdulal jamil sir thank you tushar assalamu alaikum and very good evening to everybody uh nothing to mention new about uh, rofik sir uh it's since 2004 i know him and learned so many things from him he is a excellent teacher and the criteria of an excellent teacher is to deliver a complex thing in a simpler way so that uh, a middle worker or even less talented people can also learn many things so uh, i don't talk much more let sir start his lecture rafiq sir um thank you jamil um i have uh, taken the liberty of changing the topic a little bit i thought that i will do one or two lectures um on arrhythmia um and i thought that this will be a good topic to start in the beginning of the year and what i'm going to talk about is is mechanism of cardiac arrhythmia um in a very simple way i mean i like as jamil said i like simple things um and uh, if we know the simple bread and butter stuff then the complex things can become uh, easier to ma manage so um i, I uh, this is bangladesh i mean this is uh, uh, this is our land and uh, i i always feel that we um are indebted to this land and we have obligation uh, towards this land and to take care of the people of course we have to make a living also um to have a better life so um just the anatomy of the heart um if you look at this is uh, looking at the heart from the right side uh, you can see that the sinus node is at the junction of superior vena cava and the right atrium it's a long structure it's not a small dot as we used to imagine when as a medical student it's a long structure about an inch long and then the atrial tissue and some people believe that there are some connections uh, between the atrium uh, between the sinus node and the av node uh, which has not been proven electrophysiologically or anatomy histopathologically um, but there are some preferential conductions and then the av node um, again the av node uh we always consider it as a round structure but actually it is not as round as we think it to be it's kind of it has fenestration it has a central fibrous body and then there are fibers coming down on this side which is important electrophysiologically because that's where the slow pathway is um and then we have the his bundle if you look at it it is gradually goes upward a little bit and then it splits into right bundle which goes along the subendocardial tissue and then to the this um, moderator brand into the right side of the right atrium and it conducts very fast and then on the left side this is the wider left bundle uh, and what it happens it it splits into two fascicles anteriorfascicle and posteriorfascicle and so left anteriorfascicle and uh, left posteriorfascicle and then it ramifies and the electrical conduction happens through this conduction tissue and it's very fast and that's why when we do an ekg it's narrow however if the electricity had to go through the myocardium then the ecg will become white um that's what happens in ventricular tachycardia um and also in bundle branch block in bundle branch block it partially goes through the bundles like if somebody has left bundle branch block the electricity will go down the right bundle and then through the myocardium into the left ventricle and that's why the left side electrogram will show wide qrs complex 
So histologically, um, see this is the cells. You have myocardial cells and then this is where, and it's a syncytium. A syncytium means they're connected to each other. Uh, other places, the cells are separate. If you look at the nerve cells, they are separate. They are not, they're connected with each other. But this is syncytium. And then what happens the way, if you look at this, this, this is the muscle fiber, and then this, these are the connections between the two cells, and these are called intercalated discs. And this, I mean, when I studied anatomy, I did not think much about it. But as time passes by, we are finding out more and more about these structures and the pathophysiology and the role they play in, in different disease processes. So this is the intercalated disc. You see, this is the connection. Uh, we see electron microscopic view. And if you look in the, so this is one cell and other cell and the connected by these struct proteins, this moglein, placophylline, and, and these are important because we can have problem with this and cause different kind of disease process. And I, I'll just give you a summary of this. Look at this. If you have this, this one is important, uh, placoglobin. Placoglobin is, is this one. If there is a problem, and that is what is connected to arrhythmogenic right ventricular dysplasia. Um, and then desmogline, arrhythmogenic right ventricular dysplasia, dilated cardiomyopathy, uh, catenin. So these are all the things that we are finding out now. Um, and the importance of finding out about this and knowing about these things that we, um, we can then target the therapy uh, of this. So I think uh, you don't have to remember this, but please try to understand these pathophysiology processes because by the time um, I did have, it's, it's not that important, but by the time all of you younger doctors will retire, these things are going to play a significant role how we diagnose these diseases, how we treat these diseases. So it's good to get used to these um, structures at a microscopic level. So this is actin and myosin, as you can see, uh, this is basic anatomy. These are actin filaments and this is myosin. And the way it contracts is this, that this myosin filaments, they attach to the actin and then they push the, my pull the myocardium to contract. So if I go back here, so this is, a, there is a gap. And then when this, myosin will attach to this actin and it will pull it close and that's how the myocardium contracts. So this is myosin and the myosin has different structure, myosin head, there is um, light chain, heavy chain, myosin neck, and this is the myosin band. And there can be disease process and, and this is troponin, different type of troponins here. And as you can see, that there's a different kind of structure. So that the myosin, light chain, heavy chain, myosin, and there can be disease of all these structures, which is very much related to uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. What happens that these structures become kind of inefficient and then myocardial try to contract and it causes um, abnormal force generation with compensatory hypertrophy. Unfortunately, what happens with Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, if you look at these structures here, this is the normal myocardial cell, longitudinally oriented and little fibrous tissue. But in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, you can see that myocardial fibers are not longitudinally directed. They are going in all directions. So they, even though it is hypertrophic, it is a poor quality um, structure uh, for um, cardiac function because it cannot contract very well in a longitudinal direction. Um, this hypertrophy is different from athletes. So if somebody is exercising, what it will happen, their fibers are not going to hypertrophy in this way. They, it will be longitudinal hypertrophy. So there, it's a little bit different. And same thing will happen in um, patients with hypertension. Uh, so though, those are not much proarrhythmic, but this M1 is proarrhythmic because there is this area of the myocardium, there's fibrosis and it produces scar tissue. 
And again, if we look at it, that there are different kinds of um, bitamycin heavy chain defect, cardiac troponin T defect, um, and different kinds of, this is actin and myosin filament defect that is causing uh, these um, arrhythmias. So um, if you look at these, um, the, at, a, at a molecular level, action potential is what generates the electrical activity. Now, some of the cells in myocardium has spontaneous depolarization ability, such as the sinus node. And if you look at the sinus node action potential, it's kind of sinusoidal, AV node also it has. But if you look at the atrial muscle, Normally, they do not have ability to generate its own impulse because what it means that if when you see this straight line, that means something will have to stimulate it. And what happens? The electricity from the sinus node will go into the atrium and generate this action potential. And then electricity from will conduct through the AV node and then stimulate the ventricular tissue to produce this action potential. And we end up with this QRS complex. So this is the P wave. Uh, and then it goes through the AV node, uh, no signal, and then QRS complex. So normally, the cells are positive outside, negative inside. And when it is stimulated, and when sodium comes in, inside becomes positive, outside becomes negative. And during uh, depolarization, then depolarization, it goes back to the resting state until the next stimulation happens. Um, how does it happen? We have, this is the cell membrane. If it's a bilipid layer, we all know this, and there are pores in the cell. And this, these are very important um, structures um, so that we need to understand them a little bit as much as we can. And what happens with this pores? Like if we look at this sodium channel, it's closed in resting state. So nothing can pass through it. So if there is a stimulation, it will open up and sodium will gush into the cells. And once there is a certain level, there will be inactivation by this blocking gate, but that's not a permanent inactivated sodium channel. And then this one will block it and then stabilize the inactivated state. And this is how it's happening. So, uh, and this will happen and this will remain closed and until the next stimulation comes to produce this thing again. Now, if you look at this is a calcium channel, again, if you look at this is resting state, opens up, calcium comes in and then closes. Look at how it happens, that calcium channel blockers, a different kind of calcium. Verapamil works here, diltagem works on this side and nifedipin works here. And that's probably explains why the mechanism the, the effect is different. So just by changing the location of where these drugs work, it defines how they're going to like. Verapamil is a potent antiarrhythmic and also antihypertensive. On the other hand, nifedipine has no antiarrhythmic action and diltiazem is somewhere in the middle. Um, so I, do I always remember these things? No, I don't remember it but I know the concept and, and the concept itself is important. Um, it's just like that modern day medicine is so big that we also, we need to know, yes, there is something available and can I find that information somewhere? So that if I need, I look it up. And I will also suggest that anytime you write a medicine, try to read about it a little bit, uh, find out how it works. Um, where does it work? Does it work at a, uh, like antibiotic will kill bacteria, but, other medicines work at different level, at a cellular level, like this calcium channel blocker, how it is working. Now, if you look at the action potential that when cell is stimulated, the initial part, sodium goes in and from negative, it becomes positive. Usually zero is around here. And then sodium continues to come in, but there is outward rectifier current. And subsequently what happens, the sodium calcium doesn't come in anymore. Potassium goes up very fast because there's a lot of potassium inside the cell. And then sodium also keeps being pumped out at the same time. And that's how this, this comes down to the baseline. 
this picture, um, just try to, <laughs> it's, it's a little complex picture, but what it happens is it took me a long time to understand this. Uh, they, what they do, they try to represent how, if this is the line, this is inward current, this is outward current. And if you look here, this is sinus node action potential. So here, there is a funny current. This is the diastolic potential. And the funny current, which is a combination of sodium and potassium, gradually increases from minus 65, goes towards positivity. And as soon as it reaches a threshold potential, it starts the action potential. At that point, there is massive influx of calcium. So it is the actual cell, the action potential is very much calcium channel dependent. And then to bring it down, there will be outward potassium. And then again, to start the cycle again, this is funny current that will coming. And this is funny current is very important because we have a new drug, which is available in Bangladesh and United States, Ibabradin. It works at this level, this uh, um, work, the funny current. And here is the action potential of the ventricular myocyte. Ventricular myocyte cannot generate impulse on its own. It has to be stimulated by, as soon as it is stimulated, sodium comes in and then followed by potassium coming in, but at the same time to bring it back to normal, we will have massive outflow of potassium and then gradually there is stabilization. So this is, this creates the different phases, phase zero, one, two, three, four. So if, let's look at a condition like if we have long QT3, what happens? There is problem with the sodium channel. And the sodium channel takes long time. It keeps persistent sodium current. So it is activation of sodium. So sodium channel was supposed to close up here so that it doesn't let any more sodium come in, but it continues to let sodium come in and it prolongs the okay, action. Yes. If it is today, we get the verbally done. Isn't prolong the action potential. And so how to order like this parathyroid within these two liters? Uh, Can you mute, Kamal, please? Come on, please mute the others. So th this is just a simple example. Long QT3, there is problem with sodium channel. It prolongs the action potential and that prolongation can lead to cardiac arrhythmia. So if you look at this, so long QT syndrome, long QT3, there is more activity of the sodium channel in Brugada that is negative. And then other kind of long QT, long QT2, long QT6, these are all potassium current problem. Um, so try to understand them and that will help um, how we can treat these patients. So mechanism of arrhythmia, there are basic couple of mechanisms that we, we talk about first three, enhanced automaticity after depolarization, which can be early or delayed and re-entry. And there is another mechanism called reflection. It's, it's a little complex to understand, but if I'm not going to talk about it, but just to, if you want to read about it, please try to read it, that there can be reflection within a certain amount of tissue and which can cause arrhythmia. But I'm going to talk about these first three um, things. So enhanced automaticity, let's say heart, so the sinus node is beating at a rate, this rate, it can become faster. Just the, the same thing gets faster, that's enhanced automaticity. Now, how does it happen? Let's look at this action potential, which is the sinus node potential. This is membrane diastolic potential. And because of the funny current, the threshold becomes less negative. And once it reaches the threshold potential, we have action potential. And this is what will decide the rate. We can, for some reason, the threshold can change. Instead of it happening here, if it happens here, like this one dotted line, you see, it gets faster. Or it can happen that the mean membrane diastolic potential for some reason can go up towards less negative, and that will increase the rate. Or I have a change in slope this funny current can change and cause tachycardia. And there are different mechanisms. Why will this happen? Sometimes it's totally pathological. 
um, uh, that I can have an enhanced automaticity or like sympathetic tone. What will happen parasympathetic? So if this is the heart rate and there is increased vagal tone, what will happen? The membrane diastolic potential will go down and it will take more time to reach the threshold, to reach the threshold and that will slow down. So that's the mechanism of vagal action and the reverse will happen with sympathetic tone that membrane diastolic potential will become less negative. And this is the basic fundamental mechanism how it's happening. And that's why if you look at uh, that, in this area, there is no role of calcium current. And that's why calcium channel blocker will not change heart rate much. On the other hand, beta blockers will. Or if we give drug like evabradine, that will slow down heart rate, but calcium channel blocker normally does not change heart rate much, as much. So this is a physiologic enhanced automaticity patient with sinus tachycardia. This is a, the commonest kind of enhanced automaticity, somebody with heart rate of 123. Now, this is um, somebody that sinus, you can lead three, and then suddenly I have P wave, which is different. If you look here, the morphology is different here. So this is a, an atrial tachycardia. The atrial tachycardia, most common mechanism is enhanced automaticity. And now this one, there's a totally new focus that comes up. There are some type of, um, <laughs> Dr. Ajizu, you should turn your camera off. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> Uh, so the, this, this is the most common mechanism of atrial tachycardia is enhanced automaticity, but also it can be re-entry. So what are the types of enhanced automaticity, supraventricular premature beat, ventricular premature beat, some form of atrial tachycardia, and these two types of ventricular tachycardia, right ventricle outflow, right ventricular tachycardia, left ventricle outflow, these can be of um, automatic in nature. And after new proliferation, so the action potential, this is the action potential for some reason, when we have, we can have delayed after potential. And also, if this delayed after potential is big enough, then it can cause this, um, another stimulus. And that will cause um, tachycardia. And delayed after depolarization is calcium. Uh, and then we can have early after depolarization, which is normally related with long QT. So this thing can happen in long QT syndrome, or if we give antirrhythmic drug, and they can produce uh, the early after depolarization. And the, so early after depolarization can, can become really phase two, phase three, and this is delayed. And phase one, uh, two is calcium current dependent, phase three is potassium current dependent. And... Uh, Early after depolarization examples are torsad, long QT arrhythmia, delayed after depolarization arrhythmia of digitalized toxicity such as actual tachycardia, catecholine. Uh, can you mute everybody, please? Okay. Uh, catecholine, polymorphic ventricular tachycardia. This is an important mechanism to understand because. Um, it will also tell us how to treat these patients. So this is an example of, uh, this is very common, everybody knows this thing, that there is a patient with a sinus first degree AV block. I don't think it is, this is complete heart block probably a patient with, and then long QT, there is one premature beat probably due to after depolarization, and the proof is that it then degenerates into a polymorphic ventricular, uh, which is torsad. And the difference between torsad and VF is basically, it twists around the point. You can see that the QRS is negative here. It becomes positive and then it stops. Uh, Torside will terminate. Reentry. How does it happen? So I'm going to take this circle. Initially, this was dis described in the early 1900s on jellyfish. What they did, they took a tissue of jellyfish, made a hole into and made it like a donut. And then if you introduce an electrical stimulus here, it will go in both direction and they will collide in the middle and then extinguish. Nothing will happen. However, if I can create a block here with some kind of mechanical pressure and we introduce an electric stimulus, it cannot go this way. It can only go this way. 
and then it will keep coming. And by that time, this part will become, it, it will be outside of refractory period. And if that happens, if there is an excitable gap ahead of it, then it can continue round and round. Now, the critical part is that there must be an area in front of this electricity, which is not refractory in refractory partial or a complete refractory period, because if it is refractory, then it cannot conduct. And that's why we don't see this arrhythmia all the time. Um, it has to be, it has to, ha it happens just at a critical time when a critical is time premature bit can produce a signal that goes in one direction and then it can go round and round. And this barrier, now this is a tissue that has been artificially created, but how will it happen in real life? Real life, we can have that. Let's say somebody has the um, in, uh, IVC or tricuspidin rollers. That's an anatomic barrier. You can have a re-entry around that area or you can create a functional barrier. This concept is a little different that you produce an electrical stimulus, it goes inside, make this part refractory and this acts as a dead tissue and the re-entry goes around it. It is very difficult to prove, but this is easier to prove. So this is an example of, this is a scar tissue. If somebody has myocardial infarction, you can have dead tissue, the gray ones, and then you have living tissue. Now I have many channels. And what the ele electricity can do, that electricity can come in through this channel and then go out, produce the QRS complex, and then go around it and come back and continue like this. And this is the mechanism of ventricular tachycardia in patients with history of myocardial infarction. And what antiarrhythmic drugs do is that we give them antiarrhythmic drug and they make this pathway so slow that the electricity cannot conduct anymore. And that's how you prevent it from happening. Or if I have drug refractive arrhythmia, we can do electrophysiology study, find this place where there is a common pathway, probably over here. And if I can ablate this, if I can block this pathway, then the VT will not happen again. Remember one thing, like if I go over there and block, let's say I go and block here, what will happen? The electricity can go down this way. That's why during EP and ablation, we have to find the final common pathway for this and we ablate this area. And that's how we produce this uh, block and prevent the arrhythmia from happening. So there is another type of arrhythmia that is we call bundle branch reentry. So th this is the right bundle, left bundle. What can happen that the electricity can go down the right bundle, come back and go through the left bundle and produce this arrhythmia. And this is not uncommon. And we, um, so this is left bundle reentry, right bundle reentry, and this is re-entry over here. So this actually left bundle re-entry is fairly common uh, in patients with dilated cardiomyopathy. Right bundle re-entry is very common in cardiomyopathy patients. I have one ECG that I would like to show and ask, uh, please look at this ECG and then uh, if we have a poll, I would like to have that up. Not, not right now. So please look at this ECG. This is a patient with history of dilated cardiomyopathy, um, came to the ER with syncope and this is the first ECG. You can see that there is a tachycardia and then it stops, we have sinus rhythm. And the question is, what is this tachycardia? Can you have the poll, please? We only have two choices, so please choose. To share. Anybody available to put up the poll? Can you hear me? To share. To share. Kamrul, Porta Dao. This sir.
Yeah, so we have only two choices. Is it ventricular tachycardia or is it supraventricular tachycardia with left bundle branch block? The, the beginning part before conversion. Okay, so I mean, I'm, thank you. So good number of people answered. Um, nine participants said uh, it's ventricular tachycardia and then 15 said supraventricular tachycardia. Now, clearly, I mean, the, the problem with this ECG is that if you look at lead V1, this is before conversion and after conversion, exactly same morphology. Lead one, same morphology. Lead three, same morphology. And that points towards supraventricular tachycardia. But the patient's history is a little funny. The dilated cardiomyopathy presents with syncope. So what I did, I expanded this ECG. If you look at lead one, look at here. There is a P wave and there is a P wave here. And I have expanded it. You can see the P wave over here, P wave over here. And it's not present anywhere else. So there is a possible evo dissociation in this patient. And then of course, you still have a confusion and this patient underwent cardiac electrophysiology study and during electrophysiology, we could induce, this is actually from a book of Dr. Klein. I borrowed it from there. And you can see that the tachycardia could be induced. And the way you find out that this is a left bundle by three entry is that before each QRS, there is, there is the his bundle electrogram. Uh, unfortunately, there is no actual electrogram recorded uh, shown in this. And I'm sure if the actual electrogram was shown, it would end up being, um, uh, there would be every dissociation. So, I mean, uh, this is the, so, so the, what's the point of putting this? That the history context and, but the morphology, uh, white QRS, but it was supraventricular tachycardia. So what are the mechanism of supraventricular tachycardia? There are multiple mechanisms. You can have, we can have re-entry within the sinus node. We can have re-entry in the AV node. We can have true ventricular re-entry. That means the electricity goes back through the accessory pathway, comes down through the AV node. But the common thing is that the common pathway is AV node. So if it is coming down the AV node, eventually the QRS will be narrow unless there is pre-existing bundle by block. So this is um, one patient, narrow QRS tachycardia. Um, and then you can see that there is a possible P wave immediately after the QRS complex visible in lead two. Um, and this is most likely avinodal re-entry. This is one of our patients. So it was actually proven avinodal re-entry tachycardia converted uh, with um, IV adenosine. And the mechanism is that you can have Electric stimulation, normally it will conduct through the fast pathway and slow pathway cannot go down because it's already refractory. However, a critically timed stimulus can go down the slow pathway like this one, blocked in the fast pathway and then go down the slow pathway and then come back to the fast pathway and then produce this tachycardia. The reason it blocks in the fast pathway because fast pathway has longer diffraction and then it can continue going round and round until we stop it either by vagal maneuver or any kind of medication. And, but again, the common pathway is his bundle. So supraventricular tachycardia, um, common pathway is his bundle. So the morphology of the QRS complex will be decided by the ventricular conduction. If the previous ECG has normal conduction, it will be narrow QRS. If patient have underlying bundle band block, it will conform to that pattern. The only exception will be if there is an accessory pathway, which I'm going to come, and the conduction is through the accessory pathway, then we can have white QRS tachycardia, which is a bizarre morphology, and it will produce um, tachycardia, which almost looks like ventricular tachycardia. So this is another patient with narrow QRS tachycardia. I can see a P wave here. Um, and my feeling was this is a, an atrial ventricular re-entry. Clearly this patient had WPW syndrome and it was atrial ventricular re-entry and tachycardia. And the way it happens is 
Eventually, electricity goes down through the um, AV node, his bundle, and then comes back through the access therapy and goes around. Because it is going this way, the most of the time, it will be narrow QRS, majority of the year, and unless there is underlying left bundle branch or right bundle branch block, or if they have rate dependent bundle branch block. On the other hand, if the electricity is go down this way, then I will have a white QRS tachycardia, which will be um, antidromic um, atrial ventricular reentrant tachycardia. This is another uh, common uh, um, uh, tachycardia that we see atrial flutter, typical atrial flutter. And what happens? Atrial flutter, there is reentry. The common typical flutter goes between the electricity goes between inferior vena cava and tricuspid annulus and produces the tachycardia. And that's where we can ablate this narrow zone. And interestingly, uh, at typical atrial flutter is more common. In, I have seen more in America than in Bangladesh. Bangladesh, we have more atrial fibrillation. And then we can also have reentry around scar tissue. Like this is the common mechanism, the common tachycardia that we will find in Bangladesh, people who had atrial septal defect had surgery and they had an incision line and you can produce this incisional tachycardia. There is scar tissue that, that produces a barrier and then you can have re-entry around it. And the way to do it, ablation that we do, there is a narrow area between this scar and the IVC or tricuspid annulus. Then if we just ablate that area, we find the common pathway and it, you can fix it. I'm going to just talk about this drugs, how it works. Like we have four category of drug, sodium channel blocking, which is disopyramide, quinidine and procainamide. Not much used. We have class 1B drug. These are sodium channel, lidocaine and mexilatin. Mexilatin actually is a very good drug to use because it doesn't have any effect on myocardial contractility. So if somebody has cardiomyopathy, uh, it doesn't prolong QT, it can be used. And then of course we have class 1C drugs, plaquenide and propofenone. These are not for ventricular arrhythmia, these are for um, atrial arrhythmias in patient with structurally normal heart. And then beta blockers. And the potassium blocker, sodium, um, amiodarone, and sotalod, and the calcium channel blocker. This is interesting that if you look at this, how these drugs work. If you look at class three drugs, these are potassium channel blocking drugs. Ranulazine, this is a sodium channel blocker. Even though it's an antianginal, ranulazine is also found to be effective in patients with atrial fibrillation. And then digoxin works on this sodium potassium ATPase. And this NCX drugs, exchanger, amiodarone has some effect on this channel. And there is a um, study going on to produce a drug which will block this and enhance myocardial contract. Look down here that we have drugs like um, class two drug, beta blocker, it works in this. Um, sorry. C-beta blocker uh, in this channel, anticholinergic drug. Uh, so potassium, uh, acid and independent potassium adenosine works there. Um, and then evabradine works on the funny current. And then if you look at the calcium channel blocker, it works on the calcium channel. So these are the different ways. And there are drugs, they're now developing drugs which will work inside in the mitochondrium to um, increase uh, contractility or work on cardiac arrhythmia. I think I'm going to stop here um, and uh, we'll take any questions if we have. Thank you. What I will do is that next week, I will continue with, uh, if you permit, uh, that the EKGs um, and wide and narrow QRS. Sure, sir. sir. One question that comes in. Yes. I couldn't hear you, brother. I think, sir, sir got disconnected. Yes. Uh, sir, in the meantime, uh, I just want to ask one thing, sir. If uh, for a center where there is no a known electrophysiologist setup or a known electrophysiologist, as per se, 
Mm-hmm. So treating every white cuirass tachycardia as VT, and then go back to uh, review the ECG after the cuirass becomes normal or the ECG becomes normal. Is it the wider, uh, wiser approach, or if a patient comes there and they start to analyze the ECG first, what oh. is what will be the easier approach? Okay, so let's start with a simple ECG. I'm going to go back. This patient, narrow QRS tachycardia. If this patient is hemodynamically unstable, this will be treated same as VT. So the, the reason I'm bringing up this point is the treatment of the arrhythmia should be decided by the clinical scenario of the patient. If somebody, uh, irrespective of why or not a QRS, if they're hemodynamically unstable, then you treat it urgently. Um, on the other hand, if somebody has a wide QRS, I have patients with wide QRS tachycardia, known ventricular tachycardia with a heart rate of 140, hemodynamically stable. I will give them medication to try to see if I can convert them. And then if not, then I'll call an anesthesia, take my time and um, do cardioversion. So the, uh, to summarize, it's not the arrhythmia, it's how it looks. What is the, the clinical stability of the patient which will decide how we treat this person? Thank you, sir. Thank you again, sir, for the excellent delivery, excellent uh, presentation. And as you say always that knowing basic is very important before uh, going the understanding of the ECGs or anything. In this lecture, you have shown us the basic things that leads to arrhythmias. Uh, I hope that the next class, you will show us the practical demonstration of what you've shown here. And it's very necessary that we correlate the academic things with the practical things. Thank you very much, sir. We are eagerly waiting for your next class. All right, thank you. uh, Hopefully, uh, the next, uh, the second Sunday of the next month, sure. we meet again and have the lecture sessions. Thank, Thank you, you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you, dear participants, for attending the session. And thank you, Bexamo Pharmaceuticals, for constantly providing us the scientific support. Thank you very much. Sir, it is a shop I am a person who is 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 a person who